All right. Um, so yes, I'll start with a general introduction. Like, uh, so the Open Diplomacy Institute, with the official support of the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, has created the G8 and G20 Youth Summits under the high patronage of President Sarkozy at the time during the 2011 French G20 and G8 presidency. And since then, we recruit, train, and finance the Youth 20 and, and use seven delegates for France uh, with the support of the ministry. And this year, the French delegates uh, won't only attend Youth 7 and Youth 20 summits, but also the HLPF, so the High Level Political Forum, and ECOSOC Forum in the framework of the UN. And today we are pleased to talk about the, the theme, uh, Don't Look Up, a good movie or a tragic reality, a critical assessment of environmental neglect in international arenas. So the movie I guess uh, many of you watched uh, will serve as a pretext to talk about climate action and climate ambition in diplomatic arenas. So is it too late? Is it too slow? How can we actually foster climate ambition at international level? when we, uh, so when countries rather have an incentive to behave as free riders in order to let others pay the costs of climate change. And in order to discuss this issue, I'm glad to introduce our panelists. Um, a non-gender parity panel today, as we are more women than men. Um, so first, Dr. Alison Blay Palmer, Associate Professor at the Bell City School of International Affairs at Laurier University and Founder Director uh, of the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Um, Dr. Zveta Chakraborty, a Millennium Leadership Fellow of the Atlantic Council and President of US Operations for We Don't Have Time. Um, I hope Rosa Björk Brins Jolstodir, member of the Icelandic Parliament and leader of the Socialists and Democrats group, member of the 2021 Parliamentarians for Peace. So we all hope that she's going to come soon. And Thomas Frion, uh, founder and CEO of the Open Diplomacy Institute, co chair of the Parliamentarians for Peace. So thank you all for honoring us of your presence. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the conversation will last one hour and a half, um, including 30 minutes, so the 30 last minutes uh, of Q&As with the audience. And at the end of all this, uh, I will let the floor to Jean-Baptiste Boissou, the French delegation of the Youth 20 and ECOSOC Forum, um, who will uh, actually say a few words about the, the selection of our delegates, our French delegates this year. So maybe moving directly into the discussion, um, a first question for Thomas Friand and Dr. Alison Blake Palmer. In the movie, the UN is, is depicted quite ridiculously, actually. So they react very late and they ask the international community to, around, uh, to unite around a, a joint communique, which contrasts with the urgency of the situation. My first question would be, is the UN actually so unable to tackling climate change? And second question would be, when and how did the UN perform in its ability to unite the international community uh, around ambitious action for climate? Maybe Thomas first. Thank you so much, Mathilde. Um, thank you so much also to Alison Blay Palmer Suda, uh, Chakraborty to and, and Rosa Bjork Bonsoltier who will join us a, a bit earlier later on for the, for this panel. I'm I'm very happy to answer those two questions. Well, the film is picturing something gloomy, but it actually pictures something quite real. Um, it it pictures the um, the UN as um as a reactive um, uh, entity, and I should almost say already that uh, to answer to answer accordingly to your question, we should clearly state that the United Nations um, is not a body that is acting on its own. It's uh, a body that is governed by, by different nations, 
more than 190 nations, and thus it's very fragmented its own political agenda. And obviously, uh, the question of the ability you ask and the question of the performance you ask is precisely determined by this fact that is a nation-driven um, uh, organization. Uh, on the ability side, um, well, the United Nations is an organization that provides every support needed for the right framework to work, which is the United Nations Convention uh, framework convention on climate change, the so-called UNFCCC. I must outline today uh, an emphasis, uh, the fact that it's today, uh, this year, the 30th uh, anniversary of the UNFCCC, because it was adopted 30 years ago in Rio uh, uh, during the 1992 summit, Earth Summit. And so the United Nations has provided all means for secretariat of this convention to work as efficiently as possible and create a global governance of climate change uh, management, or I should say climate crisis management. Um, so essentially it's providing means, but at the end of the day, uh, it's nation states which remain sovereign and thus it's national interests which govern um, the ability of the United, United Nations to deliver uh, in managing the UN and uh, the crisis. What is key also in the UN ability to, to do so is the fact that it has empowered the scientific community um, to bring, uh, to, to give data and, and to drive policy with science. And we also must mark the 2022 year as the year uh, of the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm conference uh, that happened in uh, Sweden in 1972 which actually was the first uh, conference on the environment that happened ever in the UN. And it actually, this is the conference which uh, paved the way for the creation of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the global network of science that provides us every relevant uh, review of scientific production to, to drive policy decision uh, within the UNFCCC, the UN Convention on, on, on Climate Change. So again, the United Nations as being an, 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 an uh, I would say an enabling actor, but not a decisive actor per se, because it's a, a, a nation driven um, um, organization. Based on that criteria of uh, judgment, it is performing indeed because it provides all relevant needs, uh, means to, to, to address the need. But at the end of the day, the United Nations, meaning the nations themselves, are quite not up to the challenge. As far as, as, far as we stand, uh, we are on the track to go beyond plus three degrees um, by the end of the century. And I'm mentioning, uh, mentioning this, um, this figure because you all remember that um, during the COP21 in, in Paris in 2015, uh, uh, nations came to the agreement of limiting climate, uh, global warming to plus 1.5 degree, and it's already doubling uh, the objective. And we know by physics that beyond plus three degrees, uh, we are not even able to figure out what will be the consequences uh, of climate uh, disruptions. We just know that they are immeasurable and irreversible. So at this, uh, if, if we take this other uh, criteria of, evaluate, uh, of assessment of the United Nations uh, performance, definitely we, we still to look up as the movies say. Uh, so that's the, um, the two answers we, 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 we could give to your question. Alison, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, um, thanks, Thomas, for your very uh, interesting um, observations. I would add one thing to that. Um, you're absolutely right. States run the United Nations, and it's all uh, state votes that count in the end. Um, I would also point to the fact that there's been a move away from multilateralism um, to a state of multi-stakeholderism. And that has opened the door for corporations to participate in a very meaningful and directful way in terms of what's going on in the United Nations. And I think um, if, we, if we look to how that's playing out um, in terms of climate change, it means that it gives direction 
uh, that's profit driven as opposed to human rights based driven as the United Nations should be. Um, and it means that there are certain conversations that just don't happen anymore because human rights are not really on the table given the presence of corporate interests and also given the interests of particular states. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think states need to actually have and exercise their power more and corporations need to be um, very much in the background uh, and not uh, stakeholders at the table anymore. I think that's part of the problem that the United Nations is facing. And I think the World um, Food System Summit is a great example of that. Uh, it was very much driven by corporations and the results are tepid um, at best. And I think that we, the United Nations, it behooves the leaders to reconsider the direction that they're going in because they could play a much stronger leadership role than they are. Um, yes, they walk, you know, they're walking the very fine line of trying to negotiate and bring together all the nations of the world, but having that profit voice sitting on their shoulder all the time is really impeding any kind of uh, meaningful leadership role that they could take. Thanks, Matilda. Thank you to both of you. Um, also talking about the role of countries in the movie, the United States and to a lesser extent, extent uh, Russia and China are depicted as the only countries that are really able to, ta to tackle the comet. Um, do you think these countries uh, have today a leading role in the fight against climate change? And as it seems that these countries in the movie ha have an important role because of their economic power, do you think the ability to, to tackle climate change at global scale is a question of money and economic power? Um, maybe Dr. Zveta Chakraborty would like to answer. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is really important, critical conversations. It's uh, great that a movie like Don't Look Up um, put this on a wider public radar. So I actually was on a phone call with Adam McKay and David Sorota last week, and we were talking about the reception of the movie and the reception of the movie all around the world. And, you know, it's doing really well in places like India, for example. I know you're asking about China and Russia, but um, there we can't leave India out of it. So some of the biggest countries that are transforming now into uh, what what the US and Western nations have already experienced are big players in seeing a clean energy transition come into fruition. So we need to make sure we we talk when we talk about the countries that have the most responsibility. Yes, it's the ones that have historically polluted. Absolutely. The United States and China um, that benefited from using fossil fuels to reach the wealth that it enjoys today, but also countries that are currently transforming China, India, Russia. Um, we can't forget the EU. We can't forget Japan. These are the top countries that are um, that, as per their GDP, uh, have significant carbon emissions. So the reception for Don't Look Up in in India was really uh, really great. And I think one of the interesting things that Adam did and David Sorota did was really identify key spokespeople and influencers. Um, so you, if anyone here in the audience uh, knows Indian. Indian culture, current culture, and Bollywood. One of the top actors is a young, uh, young sort of Leonardo DiCaprio, the Indian version of Leonardo DiCaprio. His name is Ishan Qatar, and he had a cameo in the movie. And so that really is an intelligent way to get uh, the attention of the youth, because we're talking about a massive population of young people in countries like India that really will have a significant role to play. And what can they do in terms of getting um, their governments to actually be responsible and environmental stewards. Uh, well, there's a lot there, and it's not just it's not just India, but like I'm like you said, China and Russia. These are the countries that are already are in in the process of transitioning. But if they were to transition their economies on fossil fuels, we are setting ourselves up for a, a dystopic future that we saw in the movie that we really need to get off that trajectory as soon as possible. So it's really critical that these countries do spend their GDP on clean energy transition. And that's going to cost, based on a new report from McKinsey, 3.5 trillion a year. Now that sounds like a lot, but let me put this into context, okay? So if we need to reach net zero by 2050, which is what 
all of the uh, consensus and the science is saying that is an additional 3.5 trillion a year. World governments, this is the critical takeaway that I want everybody to remember here, are spending more than 5 trillion currently, 5 trillion a year on fossil fuel subsidies. There it is. We've got the money and we can get China and Russia and the European Union to stop subsidizing fossil fuels to make polluters pay the combination of removing the subsidies and putting tax on carbon will actually result in more than what we need to ensure that we actually hit that 3.5 million investment into clean energy transition. So that is uh, these figures are from um, the International Monetary Fund. And we already have seen that countries over 130 countries are making this pledge to reach that three uh, 1.5 maximum warning, warming by the end of the century, which means we need to get to net neutral by 2050. Let's use the money that we are already putting out there. That's what we need to see these governments uh, really take action, step up and do. And who's going to do that? The youth of these countries. So let's mobilize the youth in India. Let's get more of these young people like Ishan Qatar, who have massive platforms uh, into more mainstream climate conversations and movies like we saw with Don't Look Up. And let's actually energize young people to to do something about this to help trans to help their governments transition, whether the government is a historical polluter or currently um, polluting. There's a role for everyone to play here. Thank you very much for those words. Uh, Thomas, you wanted to react. Yeah, actually, I'm very happy to hear what Sweda just said. Um, um, we've got the money. We just need to remember this. It's not a financial issue, it's a purely political will issue. And therefore, um, Sweda just said, let's mobilize youth and energy about this. I'm, I'm saying, let's mobilize banks and insurance companies and funds to get this done, because those are the key players which can make it real, impactful, and up to scale as fast as we need. Um, on top of that, I wanted to highlight the fact that Sweden is making a very ma major point in saying that um, it's now no longer uh, a question of knowledge or science. It's, it's become a question of narrative about hope, about what's next. And what I found fun in, um, and very powerful in that film is that it, cre it precisely take, takes another angle into policy conversation about climate issues with a film, with a, a simple movie. And, and, and to me, there were key milestones in getting up to dealing with the climate crisis. One of them is obviously the creation of the UN and UNFCCC, as I recalled a bit earlier on. The other was probably uh, the COP21. But along the road, one of them was clearly the, film, the movie that uh, Al Gore uh, created, An Unconvenient Truth because this is probably one of the key milestones at, at the moment of which we have turned the page of climate skepticism, not once and for all, but we have moved forward. And I think that this other movie is another milestone to get as many action as possible on the table. And therefore I'm, 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 I'm taking that lesson to those who listen to us today. It's um, the battle for climate change is no longer only in policy arenas, it's also in the content creation and cultural um, industry, entertainment industry, for us to provide a, a positive narrative of, on the need uh, and the ways to address this emergency. And the last point I actually wanted to make, um, because uh, Swedes was very clear on the fact that we had financial means, but she, she talked about uh, cumulated and annual emissions, which, which is key, because your question was, does the US, China, and Russia have the power to make uh, a change here? I'd like to, to share my screen in showing you guys how this has changed over the past few years. So those are World Bank figures from, 19, uh, from 2018, and cumulated emissions, um, uh, annual emissions clearly put China first as a the major um, country to, to face this issue. As we know, since the creation of the NFCCC and, and particularly since 
the COP21 Paris Agreement, we have a shared but differentiated responsibility between states from the north and the south to address the issue of carbon emissions. If we just look at the yearly stock, uh, uh, the yearly stock, clearly China is the first uh, and foremost country to, uh, which has to deal with this issue, and France is in, is not even in, in the top the top five, for example. We do represent less than one percent of carbon emissions. If we look at cumulated emissions, it is a bit changing the landscape, but China is still very on on. On, on, on top two countries. There is actually a G2 being formed by the US and China. And, and, and France is still on the list, but it's not as high as it has been over the last decade. What I'm meaning there is that this notion of shared but differentiated responsibility to address the climate issue is remaining a very powerful policy notion that needs to shape our international um, cooperation to address the issue, but it, th this notion is, sh is changing. And clearly China is no longer uh, a least developed countries, is no longer an emerging country. It's now part an emerging country and part a developed country, which has to account uh, as much as the US, as, as Russia, etc., cetera, to, to address the issue. And I'm, 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 I'm always a bit skeptical on having in the mind the fact that this notion of shared but differentiated responsibility that was established 20 years ago is now still driving the policy discussion while China is no longer uh, a developing country. It's, it's, it's the major super economic superpower that has to account for this responsibility specifically. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and this leads to the question of how to foster ambition for climate and biodiversity in international ar arenas. So not only in terms of big commitments, but also in terms of concrete actions to be taken. Uh, maybe a question for Alison and then Sveta. Uh, thanks very much, Mathilde, and uh, thanks for sharing those uh, slides with us, uh, Thomas. It's uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. It animates exactly what uh, Sweda was talking about. And I'd like to pick up on the positive tone that Sweda uh, struck. First of all, that we have the resources to solve the problem and that we have the tools in our toolbox to solve the problem. So I think that that's the message now. And one of the issues I have with the movie is how negative it is. Um, I think the Al Gore movie and Inconvenient Truth made that point to anybody who wanted to listen really well. And I think what we need now are people who are going to show everybody that they can be included in the new economy, in the green economy, um, where alternative technology, alternative solutions. Um, and I'm big on a merging of indigenous uh, and traditional knowledges and local knowledges combined with uh, science. I, I think that we need to have a, an open uh, perspective on where our solutions come from. But I think that it's important to, um, to tell the story of what we could be doing and how that is a positive story and get off the dime of, you know, there's a comet coming and the world's going to blow up. I think if if you want to be part of the solution, then you need to know how to do that. And I think uh, information like Sweater provided is critical because it tells people that we can move forward and what the United Nations could do is show people what those solutions are as opposed to dwelling on, um, we need to know where we're going. We need to have that North Star for sure in terms of 1.5, but what we need is specifically how we can get there. And I think that that's, and everybody, I mean, um, if all the people who were interested in making this change banded together and drove the economy in a different direction and moved away from fossil fuels, uh, we would be in a different place right now. Well, I wanna echo everything Allison just said, hear, hear. Um, very, much, very much agree with your assessment, except for the movie. I would say that the movie was alarming. Um, and as a behavioral scientist, it, we need to be alarming. This is how communications are actually successful, is getting through all of this, the really saturated landscape out there um, on all, all things climate change and capture people's attention. This movie did really well for a reason. It was, well, of course, star-studded, uh, but then it was, it was intense, it was scary. And uh, 
it is it is that we have to say what it is climate change is like a meteor meteor coming towards the earth and mm -hmm. we have to describe it as um as the reality of what we are facing to get people's attention now don't leave it there uh communication exactly. 101 is right yes. you should end very much on a and now this is what you do uh, so that you leave the planet in a space capsule and everybody blows up <laughs> right. right well it was like that you know that's something adam actually also noted was that their main uh partnership coming out of this was with count us in so count us in was started by ted uh tedx glasgow actually and then taken over by ted countdown and the idea is with the support of ted countdown and all of its network and and um and spokespeople they were able to create a really strong campaign aligned to the movie to kind of move people towards action so great we've seen this we've seen this you know alarming uh kind of narrative of what's coming now can you count us in you now you can count us in to do x y and z so that was there but it wasn't as prominent as it could have been i definitely wish at the end of the movie there was something along the lines of go to www dot you know without you having to look it up yourself and figure it out because it's a combination of fear and hope that drives people to action. So yes, something scary is coming, but we can be solution oriented. There is strength in numbers. You add one person to an effort or a campaign. Now you're a team at a third person. Now you're a group and you can just, you can amplify um, efforts, hopeful efforts towards climate solutions that way. And that's where we don't have time comes in. So I wanna just share a little bit about my organization. So I'm the US president for We Don't Have Time. Uh, it's a group that was based in, it's headquartered in Stockholm, Sweden, um, really known for, our founder was the one who took the picture of Greta Thunberg sitting in front of Swedish parliament, holding the sign uh, and it went viral. It went onto our platform, our app, and then linked into all of the other net social networks. And that's really kind of what put her name on um, the global stage. And that was that was the uh, the, founding kind of principles for our platform we don't have time it's totally free to use and download so please everybody who's here take a moment look it up download it and start create a profile and start using it that's a very tangible action step that you can take to really start getting involved and being part of the solution because that's what we need we need to amplify each other's efforts we need to share good ideas we need to connect with one another and we need to scale solutions that is uh, something that every single person can take part in, whether you're an individual, you're a student, all the way up to if you're a policymaker or you're a multilateral decision maker, like those who are in IMF or UN that we've been talking about. Everyone has a role to play here. And we have the tool and we have the technologies to help support those efforts. So again, the whole idea is connecting good ideas, scaling these solutions. So there should really be no excuses here from the movie uh, being scared um, looking up count us in joining that effort and now I, I I'm uh, stating clearly another tangible action step is is join the we don't have time effort and you'll see the platform is primarily positive that's really important and you'll you'll see that as a theme that I'm talking about throughout and I I know Allison is the same here and same with Thomas is we need we can solve this we've got the solutions we've got the uh, technology we can deploy what we already have to really make strides towards confronting the climate crisis and overcoming it. And we can put research and development into uh, solutions in the pipeline. Sure, I mean, that should not that should all be part of this multifaceted strategy towards overcoming this crisis. Um, but what we need is we need to actually have people come together and act. And we need, we need policymakers to make some tough decisions that might be not attractive in the short run, but ultimately best in the long run. And individuals have a big role to play in convincing policymakers to do that. So. Um, the solutions you'll see on the app are very supportive, very positive. 70% is show 70% of the solutions on the app are really directed towards good work being done. Like here is examples of communities, local leaders, um, multilateral efforts in uh, private sector efforts, really positive. But there's also what we call climate warming warnings, which is, um, letting people know that they're not doing right by the environment and based on that getting actions to change so one example is tesla accepting bitcoin you'll remember now it seems like they're going back to accepting bitcoin but you'll bitcoin is energy intensive and tesla was 
overwhelmed with negative pushback from the climate concerned global community to no longer accept Bitcoin and they didn't. So there is really power in numbers here. And that's the point and the purpose of this app is to help individuals not feel that they're, uh, that they don't have a role to play that, oh, what is, what is one person gonna do? That's what I hear all the time. No, there's a lot you can do. Check out Count Us In and check out the We Don't Have Time app and no more excuses, start getting involved and reach out to me. I'm very easy to find as well. So please join the We Don't Have Time movement. Thank you so much, Zveta. Um, maybe a question for, for Alison um, on, on the role of uh, companies. And you said that uh, companies has a, have a very important role to play also in this transition. But the movie gives uh, quite a negative image on that um, mm -hmm. and about the, the, the role of lobbyists. Um, so what would you say about the, the role of companies in this transition? And uh, what would you say about the role of lobbyists? Um, because uh, in, in the movie, um, this is very negative in terms of um, uh, companies being able to, uh, to drive climate skeptical uh, opinions or lowering the speed of uh, climate action. Um, so yes, what would be your, your, your um, opinion on that? Yeah, well, um, companies are definitely, have definitely captured a lot of the, um, the dialogue around uh, climate the climate crisis. And I think this is particularly the case in the United States. Um, uh, and we see it here in Canada as well, uh, for sure. Um, and I think the problem is it's polarizing. Um, and I think that we need to move away from that polarizing conversation. Uh, I think we need to make spaces for people to, and the movie does do this, is to think about what the implications of things like the climate crisis are um, and uh, organizations such as the one that Sweta is um, the we don't have time are opportunities for moving things in a more positive and clearer direction and enabling the corporations who have a vision for genuine sustainability to prevail and I think that's really what um, needs to happen is there needs to be an enabling environment for those corporations to succeed and a disabling environment for the corporations who are driving the planet in the wrong direction um, to be um, somehow sanctioned. Um, one of the things that I find interesting and that, that could be um, a, 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 an opportunity for corporations um, to make a contribution to the United Nations, uh, because the United Nations is underfunded, is in Italy, for example, corporations are taxed and that money goes into a fund to support social um, economy initiatives. There could be something similar um, for the climate crisis. But as Sweta pointed out, there is enough money to make the change. We're, we're not actually lacking money. So uh, it, it's a question of people getting together and supporting um, the technologies that are going to take us in the right direction and divesting themselves of the te technologies that won't. And the more, um, I mean, we reach a tipping point, at a, hopefully in time at a certain stage, right, where um, we tip in the direction of we've now got a very vibrant green economy and um, it's working and the, the, um, the other economy is falling by the wayside. Um, and I think that in a way, uh, our response to the pandemic has shown us that when, the, um, when scientists come together and they use existing technologies, we can really create miraculous results. Um, the fact that we have uh, vaccines that are readily available in privileged countries, we still have a lot of work to do rolling the vaccination, um, vaccination rates out to less developed countries or um, the global south. Uh, but I think that that does show us that when we put our minds together, we can accomplish great things. And to me, that's a hopeful story. Um, there's a lot of quid pro quos there and a lot of <laughs> things that we need to be cautious about as well. So we don't get ourselves into uh, back to where we are. But um, I think it is a hopeful story. And I think that all of the different um, initiatives and challenges that are on things like the um, 
the uh, the organization that Sueda we don't have time uh, is is bringing uh, to people's attention is really important. And I think that that sort of does an end run around the companies that are making things difficult um, and, and not uh, moving in a positive direction. They're doing greenwashing and they're doing uh, false social corporate response, sustainable corporate responsibility initiatives, and they're not really moving the needle in a good direction. Uh, and I think the youth have a huge role to play here. I mean, it's your future, right? Um, and it's your planet that needs to be protected for the future. And, uh, and giving people tools to make change is really important. So um, I think, yeah, and, and consumers do have a role to play, but so do policymakers. There's a lot of structural um, things in place that privilege um, corporations and privilege profit over human rights. I mean, if you look at human rights violations around the world and planetary right violations um, in the form of climate change. Another um, thing that, uh, that might be worth noting here is Thomas had signaled uh, insurance companies and banks. I think insurance companies are a great uh, corporate presence that could be levered because they're having to figure out what to do with the, um, the devastation, the small devastation, although big devastation that we're uh, experiencing right now as a planet, um, through forest fires and and other uh, droughts and all of the things that are related to the climate crisis. So if those people could be brought on board and um, help made uh, and, and enrolled to help with the solution, then I think that that could be also a positive in terms of corporations. Thank you. Thomas, would you like uh, to add a word on the role of corporations? Uh, being part of the solution because they are playing a massive role in, in carbon emissions too. And on the other hand, also um, regarding the movie, uh, maybe playing a role of uh, lobbying that may have a negative impact on, on the ambition of, on climate. Thank you so much, Matilda. I'm very sorry if I do say something that um, overlaps with what has been said before because I was trying to help Rosa to connect and I, I missed part of the conversation. I'm very sorry about this. Um, the company's role is, is, is critical, as we said, um, because they do account for a very major part of carbon emissions. Um, we always hear that music that it's up to our own individual responsibility to make a change. I, I fully distrust that um, that speech and discourse. It's major players, ma major players, states and companies who should lead the way forward and definitely um, that would make an impact and meet the targets on time. So I definitely look at companies as, as major um, game-changing actors um, to, to achieve not only climate uh, carbon neutrality, but in general, the, the, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. How can they do so? First, indeed, stopping lobbying that prevents uh, to get there. So I have the kind of feeling that there is a decreasing, that's probably my own optimism, but there is a decreasing op um, tendency to prevent uh, from being uh, from the tr from transitioning, still there are many resistances, and 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 that's why I was referring to the financial industry first, because if the financial industry moves, then the, the whole rest of the economy moves, and to my from my window, what would be the most effective policy strategy to make a move in the economy was would be to. Um, use all regulatory tools that we do have to control and, and drive financial institutions to uh, change their portfolios, uh, switch their investments from a carbon intensive to a low carbon economy. And, and if this financial swift um, happens, then probably the rest of the economy will be transitioning faster and faster. This is what we had envisioned as a general approach with the, the notion of the 
uh, carbon emissions trade um, systems as well as the, the, the carbon taxation. But obviously, this is not enough. And again, it's not an issue of do we have the financial means. It's the it's a question of how do we flow the the money into the right direction, because we do have the money we need. And therefore, I I do believe that um, having a very tech um, a very relevant financial regulation that applies to all financial entities, uh, insurance companies, uh, funds, uh, asset managers, banks, is key to usher uh, into this new era where we get to the right point. And then, obviously, the other critical type of companies to make a change is um, what I would global, uh, what I would call global player, which structure a supply chain. Uh, for example, um, if I take uh, in in the French um, uh, in the French um, economy, if I take an example there, L'Oréal, for example, is clearly driving the whole um, industry of um, cosmetics and its uh, supply chains are rooted all over the world. And when L'Oréal changes its um, um, its sustainability policies and, and tries to roll them, out, roll them out all along their supply chain uh, in the more than 100 countries that they are incorporated into, then it's a global change. And it's, 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 casc uh, it's casc cascading from a uh, a big group to smaller companies, to SMEs, and, and then to very, very local grassroots uh, community-driven uh, uh, entities there. So I think th those are the two major ideas we need to articulate in making sure that companies are part of the solution and not only part of the problem. Um, on, on Aside the lobbying issue, which is to me um, very, important and we need to address it um, as as for europe for example we we have strong legislations on how to avoid lobbying uh, too intensively but obviously that's it's no longer only a lobbying issue it's it's the way we drive and flow money into the right direction and to make sure that uh, those who, who structure uh, with their own business model uh, whole supply chains throughout different countries can can roll out this uh, and, 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 and implement these changes. To me, this is the game-changing thing. And, and um, concluding in, in highlighting the importance of what Sweeta said uh, earlier on in our introduction, or was it, uh, Alison, I don't remember exactly, um, it's that it's, a, it's now a multi-stakeholder issue, meaning states only, they don't have the power to achieve it. Many countries in the world have a more powerful uh, economic um, strengths than some states. And therefore, we need to consider companies as fully fledged um, um, stakeholders in that change. I'm, I'm concluding there because we managed to get Rosa uh, Bureau Principal Dutti getting connected to the panel. Hello, Rosa. Happy to see you um, in the panel. Uh, Hello everyone, thank you, and uh, I'm so sorry about the inconvenience, and so sorry that I'm so late into the meeting. I'm not very, very um, good a technician. Let's say it's, that it's all a connection issue. We we uh, I was online with you for the last uh, 40 minutes, so I do know that you were connecting very connect, trying to connect very hard. I, I leave it to Mathilde to introduce you to to again to our audience and to the panel, and and get you a good sense of where we stand in the discussion, because I was myself trying to answer a question which I could not even hear because I was trying to connect you on the phone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosa, for, for joining us. Um, and yes, so you have um, the, the audience is actually composed of um, um, young people from uh, 18 to 30 uh, who um, candidated to, uh, to, to become uh, the French delegates to the youth 20 and youth seven. And so they, they are very, very aware of uh, international issues. Um, and, uh, and as we are talking today about um, 
environmental and climate action in international arenas. Um, in comparison to the to the movie Don't Look Up, we've been discussing about the role of um, uh, the role of civil civil society in fostering climate action, the role of youth, of course, also the role of uh, companies if they have a positive or negative impact uh, on this ambition. Um, and also about uh, the the critical role of the of the UN uh, regarding uh, those uh, those issues. Um, thank you very much for this, and I'm also going to introduce you to the audience. Uh, so you're uh, Rosa Björk Brinsal Stodir, a member of this of the Icelandic Parliament and leader of the Socialists and Democrats group and member of the 2021 Parliamentarians for Peace. So thank you so much for joining. And I think you'll have a good opportunity to discuss with the audience because in the last 30 minutes of the discussion, we are going to, to have a Q&A session with the audience. So uh, I think it will be um, for us to, to have you in, in this part. Um, maybe um, uh, another question I wanted to, to raise is um, the issue that we see in the movie on the opposition between facts and opinions. Uh, that is a pattern of our modern, modern societies, because in the flow uh, we see on social networks we, and, our, and in the media, we, we, we don't know what information we should believe or not and all information appear to be equal. Um, and this feeds also conspiracy theories and relativism. Um, maybe a question for you, Rosa and Sveta, um, how to promote scientific culture within international arenas and for all citizens? Uh, thank you so much for repeating the, the uh... The highlights of your discussion before I came and, and and yet again so sorry for my technical problems here entering the the meeting um, this question is actually has been very um, very important for the last years both regarding COVID and the misinformation and the the use of false news and misinformation and the spreading of misinformation regarding COVID vaccination and uh, medical information and scientific research but also when it comes to um, uh, the climate change. And the, 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 the solution against the misinformation war, actually, I think this is a quite, we can compare it to some kind of a war going on between misinformation and, and also the, the right information based on, on research and, and scientific um, uh, reports. I think that is, of course, educate and to broaden the discussion between people, because it's very, it, it is actually, maybe you've already discussed that, but we, we are seeing in a social debate that it's always getting more narrower and you can close yourself into a, into a group that is uh, fully agree with your opinions and you never hear the other opinion when you're closing yourself into this, uh, the, the, the opinion groups, as I call it. And I think we have to uh, fight this very hard, actually, because it, uh, we, sh we see it, for example, in the States when it comes to democracy and politics, that this increased the polarization, it isolates groups and people with, with, uh, with strong opinions and make the opinions harder. And we don't get the chance to inter, being with other people, with other uh, with other opinions, and that is actually the core of uh, democracy: to interact with each other, with different opinions, and get ourselves to some kind of uh, agreement or a solution, and work forward from that. And this is extremely important when it comes to climate change. And we cannot waste all our energy and time to debate on whether the information are right or wrong. The, the facts are there and we need to work from that. And, uh, but we cannot go into uh, some kind of uh, missionary positions. We, we are not uh, missionaries. We have to have a discussion 
we have to find a solution to this huge problem that, that we are facing for us and, and the coming generations. I don't have the solution, but I think the, the educational part of it and also some kind of institutionalized the, the discussion between different groups. I think that is something that is vital and, and all the inter, both intergovernmental uh, uh, organization and also the politics and also the institution has to work very uh, decisively on that. Thank you, Rosa. Svita, do you have a, a reaction to this? Yes. I. Um... I echo everything that Rosa just said, and I would also say we need to improve public literacy on mm -hmm. science. Uh, that is something that needs to be systemically done from multilateral all the way to local levels. And by doing so, we would make it easier for those, um, regardless of where they are in the education process here in the US, we say K through 12, but have the appropriate level of literacy public uh, understanding of science taught so that this we can we can kind of uh, help people make better decisions rather than forcing people to confront science um, later later in their life and career. So we really need to change the system so as to give the science literacy support that's needed at the age appropriate level starting from kindergarten. So that's one that's not necessary and that's something that the students who are um, in attendance on this panel and the work that you're going to be doing going forward into the future to keep in mind, you know, regardless of what contribution you ultimately end up doing um, as it relates to the climate crisis, this is this is something that can be supportive, supported through your careers, regardless of exactly what your title will be or whether you'll join a not for profit or a multilateral institution or as a policymaker, there is a role you can play in ensuring the support behind public increased scientific understanding, um, increased public scientific understanding, I should say. So that's one. And then I would charge individuals. So yes, we need to make it easier and better for people to have access to science and to be able to tell the difference between good data and bad data. You know, statistics should be taught much sooner than it is and all of that. Uh, but in addition, as individuals, this is my upcoming TED talk. So I go into it in much more detail, but the idea is this confront your innate radical biases. So what I mean by that is we are we are intrinsically wired as humans to be influenced by factors outside of uh, numbers, outside of data, outside of base rate statistics. We are influenced by whether or not something is familiar, whether or not something is coming from a trusted spokesperson, whether or not something is natural or perceived to be man-made, these are all influences that will determine our perception of risk around a particular issue. So we underestimate risk very regularly. We underestimate risk, especially risks associated with climate change and its impacts. And we overestimate risks around things that we, uh, we don't need to worry about as much. Like we are much more concerned about getting on a plane than we are about getting in a car, despite the fact that it is far safer to get on a plane than to get in a car. So understand this about yourself. Recognize that you are being influenced on the regular um, by all kinds of factors that are outside of the particular issue at hand and radically confront it. Radically confront your innate biases. Ask yourself why this perception has come up, why, we are, why we're thinking this is risky or actually not risky. Do the research. Use, there's, there's protocols for identifying credible sources, uh, definitely, the sources online that are from science science databases, that's a no brainer to go to those first, but not everybody is inclined to do so. So if you're going to go to news articles, really double check and triple check what the um, who the sources are, who wrote the articles, what is, uh, where, where is this, are these articles leaning to more towards the conservative perspective, more towards a liberal perspective, check your sources, check your sources, go to credible sources, and anytime you notice a perception arise like, oh, this doesn't, you know, this, this is something I, I'm really worried about versus I'm not even thinking twice about where my energy, my gas stove, why am I still having gas come through the stove as opposed to electric? And why shouldn't I make the change, you know, if you can make the change. So question every perception that comes up and double check all the sources that you are, um, you are using to research 
the actual base rate statistics around those perceptions that arise. Let's align our perceptions to reality. That's my big takeaway for everyone here. We are not aligned. We are constantly influenced by outside factors and we need to better align perceptions to science, perceptions to data. And everybody can do a little bit better there. We really can. Thank you for these tips, Sveta. Um, Thomas, you wanted to, to react before we, we start the, the Q&As? Thank you, Mathilde. And, and indeed, uh, I, I would kind of um, not rephrase, but elaborate on what Sveta just said, um, essentially, which I would sum up. So it's all about getting off our getting out of our own bubble. Uh, and therefore, we need to understand the fact that social media business models are based on micro-targeting, uh, which means um, every time you use a Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever it's the social media account, you are um, subject to many many algorithms which look at what you look the timing you publish anything the type of likes you do uh, the type of dislike you do etc and this is putting you into a echo chamber an echo chamber mm -hmm. meaning you will hear view understand only what algorithm do believe you should hear look and understand and this is the business model of social media and therefore, as social media are companies which need to have a business model, um, well, there are two options. Either we do break this business model, so we break this innovation of social media, which is not obviously an option for anyone, or we do regulate this business model in integrating ethics on the way uh, algorithm address this issue of eco chamber and, um, and, and prevent you from getting out of the bubble. And there is a very beautiful word that democracy invented years and years and years ago, which is pluralism. Pl 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 I'm sorry. About pluralism. That. <laughs> Plur <laughs> yes, you got it. Thank you, Rosa. Pluralism. And this is missing. This is the point missing in the way social media work. Uh, this is something that has no longer missed for years now in traditional media, but social media miss pluralism. And if we ch just reintegrate pluralism in the way algorithms of social media do work, then we can have an avoidance of this eco chamber bubble. I'm not saying that uh, Sweda is wrong in saying we should all do our own job to get uh, out of our own perception or question those perceptions. This is a very a uh, powerful statement that I fully agree as a French um, uh, citizen, which was um, trained and, 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 and educated with Descartes, which is uh, the French philosopher that clearly states so like three centuries ago. But on top of this uh, Cartesian approach to, social, uh, to, to the digital economy, we, we still need to address the question of how do business models of social medias take into account the pluralism need? And therefore, I would just would like to mention, because we are not talking about something that is unsol uh, a problem that has no solution, uh, the OECD and the UNESCO are working on very, on, on, are intensively working on ethics of AI to make sure that algorithm, either in social media, but in general, whenever an algorithm makes a decision, avoids um, putting us into bubbles. And therefore I'm saying it's not only an individual effort, it's also a political issue that can be addressed at the international level. And it has to be addressed at the international level because platforms uh, that we are talking about, those are global players with global markets. And this is thus a global problem. The thing is that those players are mostly regulated by US laws and nothing mm -hmm. else. And that that's, one of the reasons why I've created the Parliamentaries for Peace that Rosa is taking part to is precisely to put into a network those parliamentarians which vote the bills and laws in their own national parliament but do have a, con a con 
a consciousness of the fact that some global issues need to be addressed within a network because at some point it's one single nat nation which has the solution. And I'm putting it there because obviously Sweden is right, we can all make an effort there, but it's also a very, very political issue that has policy solutions and we need to, to, to keep that in mind. Thank you so much uh, to Thomas and to everybody. Um, we have one question from Cécile Genot uh, in the chat. Uh, I think Thomas, you are the only one able to add someone to the to the panel so that Cécile can ask her question uh, online. I, I just corrected this um, oh, perfect. wrong issue and you should now be able to- uh, I will try it. Our guests. Allow to talk, perfect. Hi, Cecile. I think you're Hi. able to talk. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a question. I think it's mainly for um, our uh, member, the member of um, the Icelandic Parliament. Um, it's uh, it's something that Mary Streep said in the movie that sounded so real to me. It's when she calculates her reaction to the announcement of the disaster coming according to the next elections. It's something that is always on the minds of the decisions makers, but how can they look past that in order to take decisions that have an impact far beyond the duration of the mandate? I don't know if I'm clear when I say that. Do you want me to answer this? Um, I, uh, thank you for this uh, remark, Cecile. Uh, I actually, as a politician, I of course watched the, the Meryl Streep role in the film quite thoroughly. And um, having, having worked in politics for 11 years now, uh, I have seen, it's not, I mean, it's not a lifelong time, but still so, so many things have changed regarding the politics and the media, the social media and the debate during that time. And I've, I've also come across and I've always seen, I always see that, you know, almost developing day by day that uh, people in politics are more concerned about the reaction or what they think they will be the reaction of people measure that out from the social media instead of keeping themselves to the core of their politics and the policy and the future vision of the project they're putting onto the table for the um, electors or the members of their society. So people in politics, in my this is my personal opinion, are actually more and more uh, obsessed by their outer image and how they are performing when it comes to PR and uh, when it comes to the social media, when it comes to the, the short version of the politics. So we're always keeping the, the information and the output shorter, narrowing it, simplifying it. So it's some kind of domification going on as well, if I may use that word. But that is a word that I, that I, that I learned in, in university many years ago. So, that, so I'm just keeping myself to that. So it's, um, um, that that's really is a, a huge problem. If we are not, uh, we people who are in politics, who are policy makers, are getting more and more uh, occupied by the appearance, but not the, 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 the core of the politics, the core of the policy that we are putting to the table. And uh, in the film, Meryl Streep is actually a caricature for this developing development. Of course, uh, people in politics have always been very occupied by the how the voters see themselves and try to adjust their 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 speeches, their 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 framing or their reaction to what they think the voters would love or like. But it, this is so exaggerating <laughs> trend. I see. I'm, maybe you not agree with me, but I, I see it all the time. So I think the the role of Meryl Streep and how her re reaction are painted very um, in strong colors in the film. 
I think that is also um, some kind of caricature of this development of people in politics who are forgetting why they're there, for whom they are there, but they're only thinking about their self, their image, and how, who, and when people will like them. Thank you, I agree. Thank you, Cécile, and thank you, Rosa. Um, I will add uh, Aurel Risson to, to ask his question. Uh, I think we already raised a bit this question, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, Sweta, you are uh, going to be able to, to, to say a bit more about this. Aurel, I think it's up to you. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we uh, do. Just, just one question, and uh, but uh, I think Alison Blaypema uh, answered before. My question was: uh, Are we sure that an alarming warning is better than an opt uh, sorry an optimistic vision? So those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can warn people, and you can still be very optimistic about what needs to be done. And if we don't call the crisis what it is, which is a climate crisis and a climate emergency and showcase the realities of what's coming, we're not going to have the solutions that commensurate with the risk of what's coming. So it's really critical that we really clearly state the challenges that are current and that are uh, forthcoming for us as global citizens of the planet. And then we make it very easy for people to make better, more informed decisions. We do this through partnerships all the way from local to multilateral policy making, and we arm people with better um, opportunities to become uh, better stewards of science and then ultimately of the environment. So there's no reason that these two things can't go hand in hand in a way that results in even more action and even more uh, mobilization of different people all over the world to confront the climate crisis together. So yes, scaring people, unfortunately, we're not, the truth is scary. The reality of what's coming is actually scary. Um, and what you don't want to do is immobilize through fear. So yes, you get people's attention, you make, you uh, get through this very saturated landscape of information by getting people's attention through the reality of the climate crisis and all the all the scary uh, reality that comes with it. And then you provide hope through action steps, through count us in, through downloading, we don't have time. You can find like-minded individuals and really take steps towards quelling that fear. That's the only way we're going to overcome this together. Alison, you wanted to add, yeah. Yeah, just quickly, there was a gentleman, unfortunately, who passed away recently named Hans Rosling, and he said, I'm neither a, uh, a pessimist or uh, an optimist, I'm a possibilist. And I think that's exactly what Sweta is saying, not to paraphrase you, Sweta, but I think it's giving people the tools of what's possible and what can happen and showing them that way. So letting them know what the realities of the situation that we're facing are, and then showing them how they can deal with it. And what's not to give them some pipe dream that's overly optimistic that can't be achieved, but to actually give them the tools that we have already, mm -hmm. financial and technological, that can be used effectively to address the climate crisis. And yeah, so it's possibleism for me. It's neither optimism or pessimism. Thank you so much. As we don't have any other question, um, if you, uh, our panelists today, have anything to add, a call to action for our audience, we would be pleased to hear that. And then uh, Jean-Baptiste will uh, conclude the, the conversation. I'll just say then quickly, I'm sorry, I have to drop off. I have to catch my plane, but... Um, Everyone, please take the time to download the We Don't Have Time app. It's free. It's totally free. And you immediately will feel more hopeful and positive and that we can really find some solutions to this climate crisis. Uh, there's much we can do as individuals. And if you really are looking for a practice uh, to kind of move you towards action, then take some time every single day and treat it like how you notice your breath when you're meditating or doing yoga and you pay attention to your breath. Similarly, think about why am I reacting to this information in the way that I am? Pause, notice the perceptions that come to mind, 
and really uh, investigate them, confront them, and then look them up, research them. This is a really easy way for individuals to start becoming more aligned to science, to data, to facts. And we each should charge ourselves to do exactly that. And in the meantime, in your careers, in your work, make sure you are supporting increased public understanding of science. And then if we do all of the above, we can definitely deploy all the tools that we currently have to overcome this climate crisis. Thanks for having me on this panel. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for these inspiring words. All the best for your, for your trip. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Maybe Mathilde, I should say something. And maybe Alison first, she, she has not spoken for, for a while. Alison, go ahead. Uh, well, I've had a lot of time and Rosa seems like she has something to say, but I think what we need to be looking for are multiple solutions. Um, so I work from the point of view of sustainable food systems. And if we look at the global food system, for example, it contributes 31% of greenhouse gases to the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And by looking at more localized food systems, which have become so important in the context of the pandemic, by looking at growing food differently, uh, using really simple technologies that are accessible, widely accessible. Um, these are the solutions that people can activate towards and that can help uh, not only deal with climate change, but also give people better livelihoods, can pr help preserve biodiversity, uh, can attend to human rights and gender issues and youth employment issues as well. So I think that we have to stop looking at things in a siloed way, but we have to look for a more integrated holistic approach, climate change, could be an opportunity to think about things in a more systems way if we want to. Yes, Rosa. No, if I may, before we, we give the final words to Toma, um, um, I think like Alison said, uh, we need of course to tackle this, this huge uh, project that we're facing, uh, both when it comes to the climate issues and the populism and the growing uh, depth between us when it comes to dialogue, we need to put our effort into international cooperation and dialogue. And we, uh, I'm terribly sorry because I couldn't join you earlier. So, because Swada was talking about the, the individual, how the individual can uh, promote uh, it, you know, all kinds of things to tackle the climate uh, issues. The, uh, that's good and that's necessary, but we need the, the broader and the bigger institution to, 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 um, to take the lead. And we cannot put this burden into the individual, individual uh, people everywhere and just say, go for it and just come on guys, you can solve this. I mean, the, we, we, this is a huger and broader task than that. Of course, we just need all this combined, both the individuals and of course the institution, the states, the intergovernmental um, cooperation and so the dialogue. And so this is a combination, as Alison mentioned, is a combination of many things that all needs to come together to tackle this, uh, this, the climate change because they are at such dimensions. So we need an international, in an intergovernmental and interinstitutional uh, cooperation and dialogue. So um, both, as Sweda said, both uh, uh, through our professional uh, work and also just in our lives, we need to 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 uh, to put all all our efforts into that. But for example, I also want to mention when it comes to climate uh, the climate issue, because uh, we also have to attack the, the social injustice. And I mean, we cannot promote uh, scientific uh, reading and the ability to read and write, you know, and, and, and see what is the right information and wrong information without tackling the poverty and the social injustice also at the same time, because that is in the hands of people who, that have had education and money and are, you know, living a quite a good life to be in the good position to uh, measure which paper is saying the right thing. So, you know, the, 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 the problems are so profound. So we need to tackle them all at once. And 
but at the same time as we look at the project ahead of us and say oh my god it's, it's huge it's overwhelming we cannot do this i am very positive that we can do it we have also attacked many difficult uh issues before in the the history of humankind and i am very optimistic despite we are having a very bad weather and covid in january here and darkness in iceland but we I mean, we, the, the light and sun is, is rising and, and I think uh, we have to come stronger out of the pandemic and also when it comes to the climate issue, we need to come stronger out of this and I mean, you can see the pandemic, how we tackle that. Yes, it was a difficult time, but oh my God, what we achieved, we had, would never had imagination to think about what we could achieve in such a short span of time when it comes to tackling a, a pandemic. So why can we not do that when it comes to the climate is issues? I think we can. So I, I just want to end in the positive notes and say we can do this if we all go hand in hand and join forces. Thanks. Thank you, Rosa. Thomas? Thank you so much, uh, Alison and Rosa, to, for these concluding uh, remarks, which are very meaningful to me. Well, one thing that I would like to add is that um, I would like us to avoid a trap that does exist, which is that technology is a silver bullet to that uh, major disruption that we face. It is one of the topics of the film itself not destroying the asteroid, but being able to fly to another planet that we don't know, which actually will provide to uh, oblige us to, to face even more challenges than what we had on Earth. And I'm saying so for two reasons. First, because we are not as relevant, uh, as intelligent and smart as nature is to provide us with ecosystems. I mean, mankind's best scientists on earth do say it is too complex to understand the way an ecosystem works it's beyond our understand, uh, understanding as as it stands now so the idea that we could at some point be able to repair what the harmful impact we have had on nature is misleading to us. And some of the most ridiculous um, tech fans say we could also geoengineer geo us and, and, and make sure we can like avoid global warming. This is, to me, this is bullshit and this is dangerous. And, and, and I say, I'm saying it so in a less political, uh, convenient uh, wording, because I, I truly believe it's a misleading moral um, uh, dead end, and we definitely need to, to take care of this. So, and, and, and the other thing is that nature provides with solutions that do functions, that nature-based solutions provide the best and most efficient solutions to address both the climate crisis and the biodiversity loss extinction. And if we rely on nature rather than on our human ego to address this crisis, uh, if we do rely on existing physics and uh, biological diversity to provide solutions, then we are more likely to be closing the gap of the objectives and the sustainable development goals than if we do rely on our pretending ability to invent solutions that will at some point cost uh, money, time, resources that we are not even able to, um, to put in a table. So to me, that's also one of the key takeaways of the film that we need to highlight in many international forums there is this, this tendency of saying, well, at some point innovation and technical progress would, will enable us to face these issues. I'm not saying that tech and innovation is, is, 
is, is not able to help us on that way. But I'm saying, well, we are not as smart as we believe we are. And nature is way smarter than we are. <laughs> and relying on, the, on, 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 on existing natural um, ecosystems is much more efficient than anything about this. So let's keep it to nature-based solutions. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. And um, there is an advice of Loralie Janot in the conversation that I advise you to read. Um, check out Biosphere 2, which is an attempt to recreate artificial nature able to support human life. So thank you, Loralie, for this, uh, for this advice. Um, thank you to everyone here. Um, and I let the floor to, to Jean-Baptiste. Yes, thank, thank you, Mathilde. Uh, I think as we are coming to the end of our third conference, uh, that is the end landmark of the of the, um, the selection of the French candidates to, to, uh, to take part in the delegations to the Youth 20 and the Youth 7. We will make the announcement of the six nominees. So thank you once again, Rosa and, uh, and uh, Alison. I, uh, uh, you might stay if you, if you prefer to, but uh, we, we might as well let you, uh, let you go on your other duties if you, if you prefer to. It, it, it really is, uh, is up to you. And um, th thank you, Alison. Oh, okay, perfect. So maybe I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you go and, and I'll announce the, the delegate. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And so uh, I, I will make the announcement of the three delegates that will uh, that will uh, be part of the of the Youth Twenty and the Ecosoc uh, Forum delegation. So so working uh, working with with me as a as a uh, head delegate. So. I'm very happy to announce that Tohan Oswald, uh, Laura Lijano, and Juliette Leboda are the three uh, French delegates that have been chosen among the 500 candidates for uh, this delegation. So congratulations to uh, the three of you. Congratulations. And I'm also happy to announce uh, the, the delegates who will be part of the Youth 7 and HLPF delegation. Um, these three persons are Cécile Janot, Pablo Gilles, and Guillaume Ménard. So thank you and congratulations to the three of you. So we are looking forward to, to, to speaking with you, to continuing the conversation. Um, and we also like to uh, thank you all for, for, for your interest in, uh, in the Open Diplomacy Institute and in the, in the delegation. Um, we look forward to continuing discussing. Um, please feel free to, to, to also candidate to, to becoming a fellow uh, at, the, at the Open Diplomacy Institute. And, um, and yes, happy to, to continue working with you all. <laughs>